Fantastic morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really excited about the, the uh, seminar of the webinar today. We, um, I'm going to share our presentation with all of you. Just want to make sure that everybody can see it. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to dis discuss the practical implementation of a living will, the uh, withdrawal of active treatment. Our speakers will be uh, Robert Jordan, as well as Priscilla Boeta from the uh, Zaid Afrikaans Hospital, as well as Dr. Janila. She's a physician. I will introduce her just now, officially. Um, right, let's see the next second page. Let me introduce myself quickly. I'm Jan Jordan, Director of Jan L. Jordan Attorneys. There's my telephone number and my email address and our uh, website address. You'll see on the right, hand, top right hand side, we are um, celebrating our 30th year of um, practicing for my own account this year on the 1st of March. The next page is, or the uh, slide, there you can see our building. Uh, guess what is our corporate colors? Um, we are specialists in the administration of deceased estates. Um, we do deceased estates property transfers. We draft wills at no charge. We are conveyances. We do transfers of properties, registration of bonds, cancellation of bonds. We are also on the panel of EPSA, FMB, NetBank, and Standard Bank. We do anti natural contracts. We do trust, and we also act as independent trustees. All right, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, our first speakers will be Robert Jordan, the Chief Executive Officer of Zaid Afrikaans Hospital. He's assisted by Sister Priscilla Boeta. She's the Nursing Services Manager also at Zaid Afrikaans Hospital. There you can see their telephone number and email addresses, et cetera. And they're based in Makelniuk in Pretoria. So Robert and Priscilla is going to talk about uh, the Zaid Afrikaans Hospital policy on, on do not attempt to resuscitate and withdrawal of active treatment. Uh, Robert and Priscilla, thank you for joining us. Doc, we'll introduce you officially just now, but over to you, Robert and Priscilla. Okay, thank you so very much, Jan. Um, we regard this as an um, honor and a privileged to be part of this discussion. Um, remember that we are not the clinicians looking after the patients. We are mere enablers assisting the doctors to be able to offer a service to our patients itself. So just something quickly about the hospital. We are um, an independent um, private hospital, not for profit. Um, and we regard patient centristic centricity as our core objective and to make sure that we offer a service of quality healthcare to our well-respected patients. Now, um, just an introduction, the Office of the Healthcare Standard Compliance um, and also the Health Professional Council, which regulates the um, um, industry, healthcare industry in South Africa, and also SAMA has got um, uh, various documents on this published, and in general, it, it is accepted that the SAMA policy on living wills and advanced directives is the golden standard to which we all um, as, aspire to. So obviously, this then form part of the hospital um, internal hospital policy um, framework. Um, and the purpose of that is for all role players to clearly understand the detail of the living will and the impact thereof on our patients. Um, we certainly recommend and we certainly um, prefer to have an advanced directive signed by the patient, patient in a compass mentor state, um, as this will clear all the um, difficulties that the patient's family must will have during the admission of the, of the patient and where the will needs to be executed. Um, <clears throat> however, it happens that we do have patients admitted without a living will, um, and that is where things become a bit more complicated. Um, in general principle, we do prefer, however, that um, there's a single spokesperson for the family that acts on behalf of the family with a mandate, clearly um, mandated for that 
because it makes life so much easier if we have to make decisions regarding um, the policy of active resuscitation going forward. So <clears throat> one of the minimum requirements that we always say is that the patient records forms an integral part of a legal document and therefore all decisions must be clearly documented and for that purpose also we have a do not resuscitate document which needs to be signed off by the physician, the clinician looking after the patient who will use her professional judgment in making the final conclusion or coming to the final conclusion. We then want uh, or require the designated family member to um, also sign the document um, and then the professional nurse member in directly involved with the uh, nursing of the patient needs to sign that as well. And we also prefer that um, another professional nurse signs this document with her to make sure that everybody has applied their mind and are actually um, supporting this whole process going forward. We do also support the fact that um, organ donation forms an integral part of a life-saving um, method for other patients. And therefore, organ donation forms a very important part of our do not resuscitate policy um, because we can offer someone else the opportunity to, to extend the life or to improve the life. Um, there's a misconception in the hospital, Priscilla, and perhaps you must quickly talk about the fact that it's not about abandonment of the patient. So people feel if they sign this document that the patient will not get the attention that they're supposed to, Priscilla. I think important um, we have, we're getting with, uh, get such patients in the hospital where there's a DNR signed. And also sometimes the misconception, exactly as Robert said, that the patient will not be attended to. Um, basic nursing care always stays at our heart and that's things that we need to do. So there's basic things that we need to provide with, like um, cleaning of the patient, turning off the patient, making the patient comfortable during this stage, and then also the support to the family from our side. Yeah, and then um, certainly also the important aspect of that is that um, I think, and that's probably the most important thing is that we have to offer dignity to the patient and respect um, because that is what they, that, what, they, that, what they deserve, offer to the best of our ability. And then of course, um, to be pain free and to be um, well fed is something which um, is part of the whole process. Um, we certainly do not want the patients to succumb to um, to starving in the hospital, and therefore we'll continue with that. Um, so to, to put it in, 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 in clear terms, that we will not um, actively participate with um, a CPR process in the hospital, and therefore, you know, if you sign the do not resuscitate policy, um, but palliative care will be part of our intend to make sure that the patient is, is actually well looked after. So um, that in short is what we, what we, um, we have, and that's the, the way that we deal with this um, sensitive issue. Um, and we also strongly recommend that the physicians seize their living will, you know, the actual document where the patient signed is as, a, as an advanced directive to make sure that they that they understand clearly what is what has been said and clearly that um, there's no misunderstanding or misconception thereafter. Priscilla, that's a summary of what we wanted to say. If you wanted to add at this stage. Yeah, I can just um, also add, and I think Robert already said that, but some challenges specifically regarding um, nursing care, I think we're very privileged to have specifically Dr. Yanila. Um, the discussions that's been held to a family is very important. You can't just put the form in front of the patient and say, or the family members and say to them, please sign. I think the explanation there is very important. And then also where um, some other challenges sometimes for us is when there's specifically not one person who can be the spokesperson. So a doctor, for instance, will discuss maybe with the, the set by, um, um, or the elected 
a person that that the communication needs to go through and sign a DNR and then later in the afternoon or the next day, other family member will come back and say, but we don't want to have a DNR in place. So sometimes that is also make it difficult for nursing staff specifically. And um, I think what may, what's the benefit here as well is where the doctor can talk to more than one family member, do a family meeting where possible, but it is also not always possible. And, um, and we, we privilege, I think we're working well with our doctors in this regard. And, um, and we really see that until the end of the patient that we give everything and the dignity and the comfort to the patient that's important to us. Thank, sure. you, Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Priscilla. Sorry, I forgot about the house rules. Just like, the, just bear with me. The house rules is that we put everybody on mute. There's a chat box. You can ask questions. Once we finish with the presentation, then I will go through the chat box and ask the questions, be it to Dr. Yanella or to Robert or to Priscilla. And then if you feel like at the end that you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, then you're welcome to do so. So, Robert and Priscilla, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, very can interesting. I, yeah, can I just um, quickly say last thing, one last thing, and that is that I want to introduce Dr. Um, Yanella Nyasuru. She's um, one of our well-respected um, doctors in our hospital. She's also a part of our doctors' consultative forum. And a documentary was made about two years ago regarding the whole COVID um, experience we had in the hospital. It's called Zero to Zero. So if you do have some time, please make an effort to see that. It's on um, Showmax um, and also on YouTube. So you're more than welcome to have a look at that. It gives you a bit of an insight to what happened whilst we dealt with COVID um, in the 20, in, during 2020. Uh, indeed, you. Robert, I've watched that as well. It's, uh, it was very impressive. Next up, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Priscilla. Next up is uh, our well-respected Dr. Yanella. She said um, that's fine. We can we can um, um, only refer to on her first name. Dr. Yanella is a physician. People, you can see where she got uh, education from at Pretoria and academic qualifications and when a professional registration. Um, she sent me a CV, but it's, uh, it will take at least 10 slides up to put everything in there. So I thought this will be will be fine. Doctor, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And we're really looking forward to your chat. Um, I've put 12 questions to, to the doctor. And the whole idea is that we'll discuss every question. Um, so let's start, doctor. Thank you for joining us. Are you there, doc? I'm here. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for the introduction, Jan, as well as Robert and Priscilla. Um, you spoke very clearly and you spoke very well regarding um, our do not resuscitate um, order and our forms and that our, uh, our forms and our, um, uh, our things that are put in line. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and thank you for this opportunity and to all the people who are um, listening in. Um, this is very important for us. Um, and I'd like to speak as clearly and as um, accurately as I possibly can um, regarding this very sensitive topic. And I would like you all to know that um, death is an important part of life and it is a part of life. And the end of life and the decisions on end of life care are very important and they're imperative to the work that we do. It sounds as if sometimes patients don't always understand um, what they're being asked to do and what they're being faced with when it comes to making the final decision as to whether they need to sign the um, do not resuscitate order, um, whether they themselves want to sign it or their guardians want to sign it. Um, and we put that question to them and we ask them and they are in a state of awe. So mostly patients are, as a society, we look at the situation and we think and we have it in our minds that when we talk of palliative care and do not resuscitate orders, we're talking of patients who are terminal and patients who have got a cancer diagnosis and patients who need to go, let's say, to a hospice. 
Um, nowadays, with intensive care being as advanced as it is, resuscitate orders and do not resuscitate orders are imperative as we are faced with patients who are either having a chronic condition which is now exacerbated and they need to either be initiated with active treatment or um, there is a patient who has got an acute illness which has deteriorated in a rapid um, uh, uh, sense, um, in a rapid amount of time, and the patient needs to make that decision, or family members need to make the decision to say there's no chance for this particular patient to make it. Um, so in ICU, we deal with those two particular cases. The, it's easier when a patient has cancer and a terminal diagnosis to make the decision of saying the patient has a living will or do not resuscitate this particular patient. However, when it comes to acute patients, patients who have uh, were well, let's say a week ago and suddenly fall ill, and now you're faced with the decision um, to either resuscitate or not to resuscitate. And that is usually where the problem comes in. For us as clinicians, we want a living will in place. We prefer a living will in place. Because if you are faced with a situation, a life and death situation, you want to know whether you need to do something now because you can always resuscitate a patient and stop therapy or withdraw therapy. Um, it's easier to do that and you, rather than backtrack and you can't get the patient back if you've missed that opportunity. Um, so time is imperative to us. So if we know when we're admitting a patient, the patient has a living will and here is the documentation, we will keep the patient comfortable and we will not escalate therapy. That is imperative for all of us um, to do our work. Um, I'll give you an example. The first patient that um, I'll discuss is a 57 year old patient. She was um, a female who had had a complication post-operative. Um, so she had had surgery for gastric bypass about 10 years prior. And she had a complication secondary to the bypass that led to liver failure. When the patient came into the hospital, she was in a poor state and had been having um, chronic bed sores which were being um, attended to by a wound care sister. And this is obviously due to chronic malnutrition, but she was also a patient who could not walk and she was bedridden. Um, given her age, she is a relatively young female um, and she came into the hospital, she was admitted into the ward for acute on chronic liver failure. Um, she was not corpus mentis and she was in a waning and a, a weaning and waning state of coma. So she would wake up and she would then go back into a slip into a coma again. And this is obviously due to her liver disease and her liver failure. Um, given her clinical state, she was not the type of person that we would want to escalate therapy. Um, we were not presented with a living will at that particular stage. Um, we decided to treat her acute condition, which was sepsis, and that was fair enough. Having spoken to her next of kin, which was her husband, he came in and he was very upset that she was not going to be escalated and she was not going to be escalated to go into um, uh, ICU for further management because she was not a candidate for ICU. Be because of the fact that there was a discrepancy with, between us and the family member, we have to go towards the family member's um, decision. And we ended up escalating the patient's um, therapy and we put the patient in ICU. And once we put the patient in ICU, um, the patient improved um, and she woke up um, and she ended up having a peg tube inserted. She ended up having a tracheostomy after several weeks of being in the ICU and her acute liver condition was treated. She woke up, but she was never the same because of the fact that she had a life-threatening terminal illness, which was gonna keep her in a vegetative state. So we got the patient to a position where she could eventually go to a step down and then she would need a home. We had several discussions with the family during the time that she was in the ICU and the family eventually after realizing that she was uh, going to be in ICU or well, she was going to be in a vegetative state um, for the rest of her life, um, now bring forth a living will. That is two weeks later, uh, two months later, 
Um, and now they show us that the patient never wanted to be resuscitated in the first place. Um, situations like that make it very difficult because now we cannot no longer we can no longer withdraw therapy. Now they are left with a patient that a loved one who is in a chronic vegetative state, um, a patient that needs care in a home and they can never be with that person um, and they don't have a quality of life anymore. So decisions such like um, such as not showing us the living will, even if you have the living will, um, because you feel uh, a certain way about us not being able to take care of the patient, perhaps if you give us the documentation, that also has its own implication in what happens to the management of the patient. Um, so unfortunately, um, it's too late for that particular patient in the sense that um, the living will no longer uh, benefits or um, basically um, we, we, we're not following the patient's wishes. We followed the family's wishes, but it's legally um, you know, correct because we didn't have the evidence with us that she had a living will. So that is an example of one particular patient. Yano, if you will um, interrupt me because I keep on waffling. <laughs> no, no, go for it, Doc. Uh, we're in your is that head. all right? You said it. Okay, so that was the first patient, and that is a particular situation where we can, um, um, we where the living will should be presented at, at the get go. Um, the second kind of situation is where we are faced with a patient who comes in um, to the emergency unit um, who has got, um, let's say, a pneumonia uh, as a chronically ill patient with emphysema COPD who was basically on home oxygen a couple of um, hours a day, um, but is relatively well. That particular patient um, then goes on and complicates with the pneumonia and ends up in a situation where they need to be escalated to invasive or non-invasive ventilation. Um, according to guidelines, we do not like to nor do we, nor are we recommended to um, ventilate a patient with end-stage you know, uh, end um, um, COPD or um, emphysema because of the fact that they do poorly and they stay on a ventilator long where there's no resources, a situation like that can be very difficult because you can basically, you are limiting the resources of ventilators to patients who you cannot get them off basically. However, if a patient like that cannot, does not have a living will and the family who are the next of kin decide you must do everything to save my mother, you must do everything to save my father, um, we ventilate the patients um, and the patients eventually um, end up on a ventilator for months um, and you decide, and then they decide this is going on too long. What can we do to withdraw therapy, et cetera? Because once a patient is in, in ICU and they're being ventilated for a long period of time, there are other complications that come in. Um, other complications being infections, other complications being kidney failure, what, um, and, and also weakness and um, generalized malaise and as well as myopathies that, um, that, um, that occur. Um, having said that, some patients do come off the ventilator, but they're not in the same stead that they were uh, when they came in. And it's difficult for families because it weighs on their resources, their financial, there's financial implications to these things. There is, it's stressful having a patient in ICU or a critically ill, terminal ill patient who um, might not get off the ventilator. So it's, it's not so easy for those particular patients. So when we recommend to the patients um, in certain situations um, that need escalation. So perhaps we say that particular patient with emphysema on home oxygen has got a life-threatening illness being a pneumonia that requires a ventilator. We can easily say with the patients and the families, um, who can we now make a decision? If something happens in the middle of the night, we don't want to be left with um, a patient who has crashed and who needs to be resuscitated. And then in the morning, everybody's upset. 
because um, a decision was made without um, discussing it with the patients and the families. So we don't like emergency situations where we don't know what to do. Um, granted, those happen every now and then. However, if a patient suddenly arrests, we want to know what to do. We want to know whether the patient is for intubation, ventilation. We want to know whether the patient is for inotropic support, or we want to know uh, in the form of adrenaline or no adrenaline. We want to know if the patient is for dialysis, yes or no. Um, having said that, that is the stipulations of the current um, um, uh, guidelines that we have and the, cu the current do not resuscitate order forms that we have. Um, it's also very difficult for patient's family to decide whether the patient should now be on dialysis. Um, I, I personally believe that that is a, a, a clinician um, decision and I should be as a clinician who is treating the particular patient, discuss with the family that we, if we are not going to resuscitate, let us not resuscitate because they, they come, they becomes a, uh, uh, a complication where um, certain patients may require ventilation, but then you say, do not give us inotropic support. If there's no inotropic support and I have to dialyze the particular patient, I crash the patient's blood pressure, and then I have caused an iatrogenic death. So they becomes, it, it's, it's not exactly in black and white. We would prefer to say, do not resuscitate means do not resuscitate. Do not attempt to even begin the resuscitation process. Um, Jan, is there any way, is there anything else that you would like me to discuss at this point? Or if there's no, any question? No, 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 I think you're on a roll here, Doc. I think it's going well. So, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, you know, maybe the next question, what factors are you, maybe you've answered it already, what factors are you taking into consideration? But um, is, there, is there specifically something else that you want to refer to? Um, yes. What about family and and um, if they don't agree or if they do agree, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, so um, other factors, factors that definitely play a role in whether we decide to go and resuscitate irrespective of the patient's um, condition is because is age. So if we have a young patient who's 23 years old, we will go all out and we will resuscitate that patient um, because we obviously age is, is, um, is a huge factor. We want patients who are young to live. Um, if you come, there are certain situations where we'll get like an 85 year old um, patient who is terminally ill and the family say do everything. Uh, in that particular state, we will discuss it with the family and we will discuss it with um, the colleagues who are involved in the particular dis in the particular management of the patient, and in that particular decision, we'll, we'll make it together and we'll say no. Um, there are certain patients who would do worse with our intervention than, pa and it would not necessarily be um, in the patient's best interest for us to continue um, with the resuscitations um, and and with the management of that particular patient. Um, Another factor that would um, obviously determine uh, whether the patient um, is is a choice is a choice is a choice patient for resuscitation would be um, the condition that they came on, um, or if there's an, a new reversible incident that has occurred, um, as in let's say the same patient who comes in with emphysema suddenly develops an acute um, arrest, cardiac arrest that and we were not expecting it was someone who was supposed to be doing well and going home, that particular patient we will resuscitate irrespective because something has happened that could potentially be um, reversed. Um, that would be very, um, it, that it's, it's every single patient that we discuss is, is an example. However, every patient is taken into um, consideration with their particular um, problem list, with their particular social circumstances, as well as their, um, their, their diseases. So um, uh, we take each patient case by, by case. So there's no blanket statement to say these patients over the age of um, such and such will not be resuscitated. However, um, it's case by case that we, we, we discuss the patients and we decide um, on what the next management will be with a particular person.
Doc, if I may interrupt you, um, it's obviously a massive decision in a youth responsibility. Do you, as a specialist, are you making that decision on your own in your scenario, or do you always get somebody else in to assist you or to make the decision? So um, if, it's a, if it's a straightforward um, candidate or patient that we need to make a decision, there's no need for me to consult a colleague. Um, if it is a more complicated situation, then we discuss it as a unit. Um, I'll give an example of a patient who is a cardiothoracic patient who is 75 years old, previously well, um, presented with sepsis, septic shock, and it was secondary to um, a pneumonia, which complicated with an empyema, so a localized septic focus in the lung that needed a cardiothoracic intervention. So now this particular patient comes in with septic shock with this empyema. She comes in, her heart rate is 150 because she's now got an acute, acute um, atrial fibrillation. She's in shock, she needs inotropic support. Um, she goes for the intervention, a surgical intervention. And she was previously well. So she's uh, uh, put on appropriate antibiotics. She is now intubated and ventilated because of the fact that this is potentially a reversible cause of illness. She's supported with ionotropic support and she does reasonably well. Um, something happens to the particular patient in the sense that they um, get, because of the atrial fibrillation, they have a sudden cardiac arrest. So we jump on this particular patient's chest, we um, resuscitate her, and we get her back. Um, and it was a short resuscitation, the patient comes back, patient is still an ionotropic support, but requiring more support than she did before. The family now um, come in, and we've been discussing this particular patient with her family. Uh, it's a daughter, two daughters, and a, a son-in-law. Um, the one daughter is uh, medically inclined. She works in a, in a supportive role in, a, in another hospital. So she understands certain aspects of ICU and medication and, uh, and the way that we work. And the other daughter is a lay person. The daughter who's a lay person says to us, do not intervene anymore. My mother is not, um, in a, in a, uh, is not who she was and is not who current... It does not resemble the woman that she was, and she would not like me to carry on. Um, so I would like to sign the do not resuscitate order. Um, her other sister, who is in a medical capacity, not a doctor, but a medical capacity herself, says, I want you to do absolutely everything for my mother. Now we have a discrepancy here in the decision making. So the patient complicates even further, and she now develops renal failure. The decision comes in, do we now dialyze the patient? We have a patient who's not waking up as well as would like her to wake up. She's elderly, she has got multiple organ failure, and she has got um, a condition which is perhaps not reversible. And if I start dialysis on this particular patient, am I doing the right thing for my patient? Am I helping her? Or am I now keeping her alive for the family reasons? So in that particular situation, the surgeon will come in and we will discuss it. The cardiologist will come in and we will discuss the decision and the neurologist will come in and we'll discuss. So when we have a, dis a situation where there's a discrepancy between family members and there is a poor prognosis from the, fam from the patient themselves, we make the decision and we relay the decision to the family to say, we've decided we are not going to resuscitate the patient because of A, B, C, and we are as clinicians, as, super, as specialists, and sometimes super specialists, all in agreement that this patient is not going to, it's not gonna be beneficial to the patient. Needless to say, they accepted it and then the patient demised uh, a few, a few um, days later. Having said that, when patients do sign a do not resuscitate order, some patients have um, the wrong, or the, not necessarily the patients, but um, the family members have um, a, a, a wrong um, 
um, how do I say, think that the patient is going to die immediately. So they believe that by you signing, we are now going to euthanize the patient the patient is going to die. No, that is not the case. The patient usually has a do not resuscitate order signed by the patient if after discussion with the family members. And if the patient is terminal, the patient will die and they will die peacefully. However, if they have a reversible condition, that particular patient will end up um, getting better and they may go home. So the does not resuscitate order does not necessarily mean they will die today or they'll die tomorrow. I've often had patients, family come and she's not dead yet. Why is she not dead yet? And that's because we don't euthanize patients. It's against the law. However, we can keep the patient comfortable and make sure that they do not suffer need. Um, that's washing them, that's feeding them, uh, supporting them with pain uh, medications and just keeping them um, comfortable until their final moments. Sure, very interesting. Um, I think you've covered this. Do you need the family's consent? Um, I think you've put it very clearly that there will be circumstances that then you as a specialist will make a decision. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Um, uh, who do you regard as family? Maybe you can just mention that. If there's a family with three children and let's say a, 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 a husband or so, how do you deal with it then? And what I think one of the questions also, what if you can't get hold? What if they don't agree? And what if you can't get hold of, of, of some of the um, family members? <laughs> that happens more often than not. Um, so the person who actually presents themselves as a family is who we consider as the family. If there's three siblings, we usually go with the oldest sibling. And usually, and it's not just an African thing. Um, um, I've noticed that with my Afrikaans patients as well. They'll say, wait, let's, let's, let's wait for Brother Henny, who is the oldest. He must make the decision. So it happens often where we get... Um, the oldest member of the child in the family who makes the decision and he will he or she will sign if there is no spouse um it the the, the delicacies or the intricacies on that comes in when there is it's now the second husband or um the the, the father of the children passed away and now um, the person who needs to make a decision is the new husband um and the family there's usually like problems when that happens um so um it's a fact it's a it's a it's a it's a decision that comes through um from the person who tells us that they are the the, the most they are the next of kin um when it comes to discussing the patient's uh, results as well as discussing the patient's um um needs etc or their condition um we usually choose one particular person because information gets misconstrued um, when you have you speak to different people so we prefer one person to be nominated by the family the ideal situation would be if that person brings um, the elderly person or the patient to the hospital and identifies themselves introduces themselves and says, i am so and so i am the next of kin here is the living will that would be perfect um, if there is no living will tell us there's no living will and the patient would like to be resuscitated we're not against that however um they must also be um the people must not have, um, you know, um, misconstrued ideas about what we can do in the ICU. We can support a life. We are not the givers of life. So when patients die and patients die in ICU in the ward, um, it's a part of life. Um, so uh, they shouldn't have um, unexpected um, expectations or uh, requirements of the ICU team or the hospital to say um, that the patient um, must be 100% better. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Doc. Um, is it necessary for more than one doctor to agree? I think you've answered that question. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, if a patient has a living will, do you still need the, the consent from the family? Maybe you haven't, I don't think you've touched on that. If there's a, a living will, and, and do you still have to consult with the family then? If there's a living will and it is produced to us and it's, it's given, we don't have to consult with anybody. However, it makes it easier to talk to the family so that there's no anger issues, there's no misunderstandings because some elderly patients may have a living will in order that they have not spoken to their children about um, or their spouses. So um, it's, it's, we do not need it, but we prefer to discuss it and that the patient has a living will, this is what is expected of her. We will not escalate treatment, but we will treat what is 
um, reversible. So if it's giving an antibiotic um, or replacing electrolytes uh, or preventing dehydration, that kind of thing, we'll do it um, if it's reversible. However, if it means escalation into an ICU or escalating the patient onto a ventilator or dialysis, then we will withhold. And then we do not need to speak to the family about that. Yes. So I think that I think the point that you also make is that a living will is very important. Um, it's invaluable to us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what are the consequences? If there's no living will. I think you've discussed that. Um, mm. You discussed with the family. Uh, what's mm. the value of a living will? You've discussed that. Um, we also, what if all the family members are not available? Uh, so you just, uh, well, I think you basically covered that. Well, I don't think, it, is there anything else you want to add to this? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, I can maybe speak about one particular patient if I've got time. Um, yes, more than there, was, there, there was a Mr. O, an 83 year old professor who um, had in the latter stages of his life developed severe dementia. Um, he had heart failure and he was, he had an ejection fraction of something like 10%. So he was not a, a candidate for any kind of intervention, um, cardiac intervention. So we were keeping the, we were treating um, the heart failure medically. Um, his cardiologist had actually discharged him in the sense, and we were waiting for, for death um, to occur. Um, we would treat the particular um, pre, uh, predisposing or, or precipitating event, and we would treat the pneumonia or the urinary tract infection, and the patient was stable. Um, the elderly daughter or the oldest daughter, let me say, no, she was not so elderly, she was in her 50s. So she came in and she said, she signed the do not resuscitate order, do not attempt to resuscitate order. Her younger brother, um, who was the only male now in the family, came in and said, do not resuscitate the patient, but give the patient inotropic support. So when they fill out um, different elements of our do not resuscitate order, that's where the difficulty comes in. Now I have a bedridden patient who has got dementia, who can't eat, who can't feed, except via a peg tube, who is in agony in the sense that he, his organs are failing. Um, we are not allowed to do anything except put the patient on adrenaline. Um, if you have that particular situation, it makes it so difficult because you're prolonging life and you're prolonging suffering in the particular patient. But because of the fact that the patient's family members are um, you know, uh, undecided about what the management should be, there's very little that you can do. Um, some patients, families even look at scripts and they're like, no, don't give my, my, my father painkillers. Don't give my father this medication, it'll drop his blood pressure. Don't, you know, certain things like that where they interfere with the management of the patient. Um, so my, my personal um, view on the do not resuscitate order, like I said previously, should not be to the patient's families as they don't understand. If I have a patient, not, not always, but uh, they don't understand the nitty gritty of it. This particular patient who comes in with the heart failure and the dementia, if now I give him inotropic support, I'm sustaining him, um, but he's in pain and he's in agony. I can't give him painkillers because it will drop his blood pressure. That is in, in a way inhumane because you are, uh, preventing us from helping the patient and in that particular stead, um, keeping the patient comfortable. Um, so that is where the, the limitations of the, no, the do not resuscitate order um, uh, are. And uh, I find that sometimes that it should just be the clinician's um, uh, prerogative or to decide whether the patient should be escalated or what on the patient should be escalated with the okay of the family. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Doc. Um, here's another one. How long can you keep somebody alive? <laughs> it can be for a very long time. Uh, I think the longest patient who we were forced to keep alive for because the doctor, the, the family member who was a, a, a colleague, um, did not want the mother to live and well, did not want the mother to die. Um, the mother was 92 years old and he wanted the mother to live to be 100. So how long can you keep the patient alive? Well, as long as God will keep them alive, yes. There's no answer to that. Sure. See, she lasted at least, I think, 200 days and then demised. So it's, it's a very, you can keep the patients alive. 
And and just in that case, did the patient suffer for those two hundred days? In my uh, personal uh, capacity, I definitely believe that she did. She's definitely suffered. It doesn't help to prolong someone's life who cannot talk to you, who has no quality of life. Um, yeah. You are actually, uh, you know, hurting the person. You're hurting them. Um, if we can keep them alive for um, as long as the reversible causes are um, treated, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. If there's nothing more that we can do and we're just sustaining life and there's no quality to it, what is the point? I agree with you. Tom, thank you so much. Let's quickly have a look at the, the chat box, what questions there are. Um, let's start at the top. Uh, dear Dr. Jordan, I like that. <laughs> I have a living will, but no family. What about me? Etienne, I think uh, Dr. Yanilla answered you. Make sure that that living will is available. And what I always say to my clients is that make sure that your, um, your, your loved ones, or in your case, if you don't have any family, then people you know that you trust, let them know that you um, have got a living will and you don't want to be kept alive. That's unfortunately the best I can answer you on that point. Um, Jan, can I just perhaps say that um, there's also a recommendation that you wear either um, some identification on your arm or on yourself or on your, in, your, in your wallet yeah. to indicate that you have got a living will. So that's just uh, some awesome. recommendation that we've Clever. seen as well. Yeah, clever. Yeah. I think it would also um, be beneficial if you give a copy of that living will to your general practitioner so that at, in the event where you are admitted to the hospital, your general practitioner can admit, uh, can uh, contact one of us and let us know that you have a living will and you do not, and those are those particular stipulations of your living will. Yeah, excellent. Um, Pamela is asking if she can have a living will. Pamela, please do us a favor, uh, or Jean, just take Pamela's uh, detail. Pamela, if we can't get hold of you, then just send us an email at info at yanljordan.co.za and we will do, help you with a living will. Um, then is a Madeleine asking the same question. Jean, please take note. Um, Sanet's asking, Ilona's asking, um, sorry, she's asking, is a living will accepted by any hospital? Robert? In my humble opinion, yes. Um, that's part of the guidelines, it's part of the SAMA recommendation, it's part of our professional council recommendation, so yes, the answer is yes. Robert, you referred to SAMA, uh, who's that? South African Medical Association, I suppose. Medical Association, yes. Thanks. Uh, Anita is also asking for a living will. Then uh, Shannon is asking the following question. If the treating physicians are in possession of a living will signed by the patient, can this be overridden by instruction by a family member? Doctor? Yes. Yes, because um, if your family members are aware of your living will, they should not come to the hospital and say, my mother was not uh, in her right mind when she signed this particular will, do everything. If we go against that particular family, we are opening ourselves up to litigation. So when you have a living will, let your family members know that this is what you have decided and that you have sent a copy to the um, uh, your, your, to your particular GP or your physicians, that would eliminate all of the problems that, that can come out and arise from that. So that, like I said, um, the one patient that I gave an example of, Mrs. E, who came in where her husband said, there's a living will, but he did not produce the living will. Um, and we had to resuscitate the patient, even though we did not want to resuscitate the patient, even though the patient had a terminal condition. So we are not, family must be in agreement with your living will and they must produce it. Yes. I, th I can't agree more with you then on that point. I think it's so important and if you do have a living will that you discuss that with your, your spouse and your children, they should know that that's your wish. Um, and you don't have issues later on. Mm -hmm. um, Anita, what is the possibility that the existence of a living will and 
and do not resuscitate, be registered, placed on record with medical aids. Um, Anita, I don't know any of that. I don't know, if doctor, doctor, if you know anything, if that's possible, and if the medical aid will allow that, Robert? Robert, are you there? Um, okay. Repeat the, just repeat the question, please. The question is, what is the possibility that the existence of a living will and do not resuscitate be registered or placed on record with the medical aids? Have you ever had such a case? No, we haven't had that before, but I think it's a good thing. I think it will be actually beneficial, so we recommend that, yeah. yeah I wonder if they will accommodate that, but um, that's something to, to find out from your medical aid, uh, Anita. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, Hillary, I'm aware uh, that a MP introduced legislation to Parliament four years ago or so to make advanced healthcare directives legally recognised. Does anyone have any idea if this legislation has progressed at all? Uh, Hillary, I've got absolutely no knowledge of that. If there's anybody um, that's any of our guests um, has got any knowledge of that, please unmute yourself and maybe you can answer this question. Yeah, no, that's also the information we have that the um, the legislation was um, prepared, but um, whether it's been presented at at, the, at um, Parliament and whether it was been signed into law, we're not sure of that at this stage. Yeah, so Hilary, sorry, we can't answer you on that one. Shannon, uh, will an electronic copy of a living will be accepted or must it have a original wet signature? Dr. Robert, how do you guys look at that? In no, other no, we words, accept it. We accept it. Okay. Yes. All right. Then you're on clear. Jan, can you just send a copy of the living will to all the attendees? We'll do so, Johan. Not a problem. Uh, what is the effect of a, uh, sorry, the question of Johan or the statement, John, please make a note of that. Then Mariska, what is the effect of a DNR, do not resuscitate tattoo on a person's body? <laughs> I've never seen that. It but... happened before. <laughs> okay. It has happened before, yes. I suppose you take it then as what the instruction? As <laughs> for instruction, I suppose. <laughs> it never happened to me, but it happened. I've heard of it. <laughs> okay. Um, Andrew, thanks, Doc. Playing God must be difficult. Either active torture or passive euthanasia. I hope to have someone as competent and confident to deal with me if I end up in a situation that requires medical professional intervention. That's a compliment to you, Doctor. Uh, Thank you for the compliment. I do not play God. <laughs> I would dare not. Um, I, it is a very difficult situation that we are faced with all the time. And to give the empathy and um, the love and the support that we need to, to patients and their families at this time is also imperative and it's important to us. And here at Zait uh, Afrikaans, we make sure that the patient's last and dying time is, is peaceful and full of the love and family that they can have. Um, but we never decide when the patient dies, God decides. It's always God. We never pull the trigger. Yes. Amen. 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 That's a very, very important question that Etienne is asking. He says, um, how do I find out what must be in a living will? Now, Etienne, we will send you one, but I've had it in the past where a living will is basically a paragraph in a, in a, in a normal will, but then you get a living will that's three, four pages. Is that important to you uh, in terms of the, the detail of what they want and what they don't want? Or is a living will a straightforward one sentence? Um, I, this is my living will. I do not be, want to be kept alive. If you have a one sentence, it's good. <laughs> one, because that's at the end of the day, when we are faced with a life and death situation, we don't have time to read through five pages. I want to know, <laughs> do you want to live? Do you want to be kept alive do you need this me to intervene etc so i don't need to go through okay do not do this do not do that do not do that give me one little sentence if not the sentence a paragraph that says do not attempt to resuscitate do not put them in life sustaining um uh, measures etc yes okay great thanks etienne uh john make a note that we send it to etienne as well um i'm not sure who sent this the industry 
to probably con consider a centralized database for living will, similar to being an organ donor, where all hospitals have access to, especially where living wills, where living wills are not shared. We don't have that. Um, it is maybe something to look into, but there's definitely not uh, something like that in place at this stage. Um, I have a couple of questions. Can I unmute? Rose, I'll give you the opportunity just now. Um, breaking up badly. Clients must know the living will must not be presented at the first estate meeting too late. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just this in general, uh, you know, you might have a living, living will. You, you don't tell your loved ones about it. Uh, the doctors keep you alive for a long time. And then only once you've died, they look at the will and then they see there's a living will in the will. Um, very good point, Quentin. That's why it's so important to share that with your loved ones. Ursula, if a person has a living will but would like to be an organ donor, how is this handled, doctor? Sure. So it depends if you're an organ donor and you're a registered organ donor, depending on what the stipulations are or what your clinical condition is. If you are, let's say now um, in a car accident or and you are you have a living will, you cannot we won't we, we have to keep the organs alive. So they will have to intubate you. They will have to keep the organs alive um, in some states. So I'm not an expert on trauma and I'm not an expert on those particular cases. We do not work in that kind of environment, but I, it is my belief they need to keep you alive and your organs alive. So in that particular case, they can um, um, harvest certain organs um, that they, as long as they keep you alive for that particular um, uh, event, and then they can switch off the life support. Um, but that uh, I stand corrected as I do not work particularly with um, uh, those particular patients. Quentin, um, he says living will is not as living will is still not passed in legislation. Thank you, Quentin. Hilary, there's a great book on preparing for death by Elena uh, Dolny before ever after. She suggests uh, you should even specify if you don't want to receive antibiotics. Anna Marie, I once heard that doctors are more inclined to withhold further treatment if the patient is an organ donor. Is there any truth to this? Well, I think you've answered that, uh, Dr. Yanella. Um, and then Ursula says, thank you. Let's go back to Rose. Rose, please unmute yourself and then you can ask the question, please. Um, hi, can everyone hear me? We can hear you, Rose. Thanks. Um, a question. In the face of a living will that is presented um, when the client is in these um, in, in the hospital, is it only considered when the client has no prospect of living? Doctor? So um, not necessarily. If a patient um, comes in and it's an acute in and out um, it's, you don't necessarily need to present it. However, if you know that you have a living will and there is a complication that occurs, say the patient is coming in for a hernia repair yeah. um, and the patient comes in for a quick in and out surgical procedure um, and something happens at that particular um, procedure or as a result of the procedure, we will carry on and intervene because it was an unexpected event. Mm -hmm. If at, at the, after that particular procedure has occurred and the patient has now complicated and the patient is currently on life support because it was an iatrogenic a medical cause that or an, uh, something that was not supposed to take care, that, that was not supposed to happen, that did happen. It was completely unexpected. We will try and see if it is reversible. If it, however, is not reversible, say the patient has a massive stroke on the table, it can happen. We would require that living will to prevent us from going any further with that particular patient. So, if it was the it was an unexpected thing, and you have a living will with you, present the living will after the unexpected event because the unexpected event will be treated. 
However, if you know you are coming into hospital and you already have your living will and the chances of you being septic, et cetera, bring the living will with you. It will make it easier for me to know what to do and not have that awkward conversation and start talking about uh, what would you like us to do in the sense that your person um, now deteriorates because it, will, it can happen. So if you have the living will and you want to present it, present it. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. No, I, have, I don't have any more questions. You, ask, you answered my follow-up, so thanks. Thank you, Rose. Maybe a last question or a statement that Evelyn wants to make. We, um, we're very grateful for the doctor's time. So Evelyn, I'll give you a minute or so. I have a, Evelyn says, I have a personal experience of the practical impl the implementation of a living will. Um, Evelyn, do you want to share it with us quickly? Thank you. Um, it just might help somebody else. Uh, my sister was diagnosed with cancer and um, was was had surgery to rem to to remove. She had a hysterectomy, um, and she then landed up in ICU um, because she was just drowning in water. Um, they found that the cancer was also in her lungs, and she just continued to get worse and worse and worse. Um, and in the end, the doctor called us, there were three of us, and w she had a living will, we knew that. And he, she, she said, look, I've known about the living will all along. Um, and I've taken no notice up to now because your sister has been fighting to live. But it seems that she has now given up. Um, and now I will take notice of the living will. And what they did is, um, they stopped, they kept her on, on pain medication. But one of the things that they had been doing was supporting her blood pressure. And they stopped that. And 12 hours later, she passed. And honestly, there would have been no point in, in pursuing it. She hadn't spoken. She wasn't, she wasn't compass mentis. Uh, there was really no point in 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 pursuing anything but it was it was good to see how the doctor tried everything she could while my sister was fighting for her life um it's, and um, then acknowledged yeah. acknowledged that the patient had given up yeah. and, and i think that's very important that people should know that okay thank you evelyn we appreciate that just um, last thing from Etienne Foster, Dr. DNR tattoo, be aware it might be on a patient's body and the patient doesn't know about it and doesn't have a written living will. In the meantime, the patient wants to be kept alive, weird, possible, interesting, Etienne. Dr. Robert, um, Priscilla, thank you so much. I think we've learned a heck of a lot today. Uh, from the practical experience, and I'm sure everybody will agree with me that it was very, very informative. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.